I'm going to take you into the world of the greatest hunters I've ever met. That's the claw marks right there. The Sand Tribe are masters of the desert. They're charging, they're charging. Keep it rolling, keep it rolling if you can. Tracking their prey for miles. Killing with poison arrows. Yeah, my heart rate's up. My heart rate's up. I'm Hayden Turner. As a zookeeper, I've cared for lots of large African animals. But today, I'm with the Sand Tribe in the Kalahari Desert, and they're hunting them. Here, wildlife is food, not a zoo exhibit. As hunters, these men's knowledge of animal behaviour here is the best on the planet. They have tracked and hunted animals in this African desert for around 60,000 years. They use arrows tipped with heart-stopping poison to kill their prey. I've got a lot to learn. This is absolutely relentless. It's difficult to put into words what's happening right now. We've been walking since six o'clock this morning. It's now about 1.30 through this incredible heat. Baking earth, acacia thorns throughout your body. My skin feels like it's actually melting off. And you're constantly getting caught on stuff. And the men just do it with such ease. At the moment, that water right there looks tasty to me. Today, Five of the best hunters from the village are taking me under their wing. They are led by Ngao, an elder with over 50 years of hunting experience. Ngao, now in his late 60s, has studied animals nearly all his life. This desert is his teacher and classroom. Also on the hunt are Touche, Toma, Ao and Neishi. Their village has 29 mouths to feed, and they haven't eaten meat for six days. This hunt is not for sport. These men kill for food. We've picked up the tracks, also known as spoor, of a small antelope. It's a dika. There are over 15 species of dika in Africa, and all are armed with super sensors, oversized ears that provide exceptionally good hearing and a brilliant sense of smell. The diker will be a seriously hard target to track. Tracking can be broken down into three main sections. Simple tracking, systematic tracking, and speculative tracking. Simple tracking is the sort of thing I can do. Follow an animal's tracks to a waterhole or something like that. Systematic tracking is a little bit more difficult. You have to know a bit about the animal's behaviour and tracks and signs, symbols that they've left throughout the bush. But speculative tracking is when you come up with a plan or a hypothesis or a storyline, and that's what these men are so knowledgeable about. The men visualise the movements of the animal we're hunting to predict its behaviour. They are virtually becoming the animal. I'm in Namibia. Southwest Africa in the Kalahari. Here, desert dominates the landscape. The Kalahari Desert covers an area about half the size of Mexico, just under a million square kilometers. The sand people use two unique languages, one for village and family life, and one language of clicking sounds just for hunting. The temperature now is 42 degrees in the shade. There's not a drop of fresh water above ground. We've found these droppings. They're still moist. 
They can't be more than two hours old in this heat. And there are other signs of Diker as well. The guys are looking at these fresh tracks right here. Just discussing what direction they're going. But for now, there's a much bigger worry. Three bull elephants are feeding close by. Elephants don't have a fantastic sense of sight, but they have great hearing and great sense of smell. So if we were upwind of them, they would get our scent very, very quickly. They probably would run if they decided to defend themselves or investigate. We'd be uh, in a bit of a position out here with not much vegetation cover and nowhere really to escape. These elephants are wild and dangerous. Aggressive males will not hesitate to take us on if they decide we're on their turf. The elephants are walking towards us here. We're in quite a spot right now. Um, okay. Touche bravely stands his ground and tries to divert the charging elephants. They're charging. They're charging. Keep it rolling. Keep it rolling if you can. Elephants can run at about 30 kilometers an hour. They're going to be on top of us in about 20 seconds. I know we need to regroup, stand our ground, and turn the elephants around by making as much noise as we can. There's no time for second chances. We have to do it right and do it now. It works. The elephants call off their attack and turn tail. It's always a sin indication when the men run, I run. About 500 people are killed each year by elephants, but the animals are not to blame. Both elephants and the sand are being pushed into smaller and smaller spaces. As both animals and humans search for food and water, confrontations happen more and more. That was a close call. The guys seem pretty unfazed though, and they waste no time in refocusing and getting back to tracking the diker. They have to if they want to eat meat today. When the tracks get a little bit difficult to find, or well, the men have to try and regain the tracks, they'll send two men out on the flank there, and they cover a massive area, and they come back together after they've gotten back on the track. With no warning, the mood quickly changes in the men. Their body language is intense. The hunt has taken a twist. Leopard mm. is killed. My gosh, a leopard. Gosh, I've got goosebumps. <laughs> we are right on the spot where a leopard has made a kill. Leopard, uh, steel rock, uh, Diker. Diker. Diker footprints there. Mm -hmm. And the leopard has grabbed it yeah. here, come, come this way. Mm. Look at this fur here. There's a little bit of fur just here, right there. Right there. And then it's dragged it through here. Oh, wow. Wow, wow, wow. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So exactly what a leopard would do, it would, it would walk like this and it would hold its prey in between its legs. Like this, like this, dragging it, dragging it. The leopard is likely to be feeding on the diker close by. Look at the drag marks here. Oh, look at that one. There's the back pad you can see right there. That's the back pad of the leopard paw. And another, all the pads there. 
And this is the drag mark right through here. Absolutely beautiful. I'm not entirely sure what's happening here, but we're following leopard prints. I feel like I'm in a battle of apex predators. Me and the men versus a big cat. The winner gets to eat tonight. Not a situation I ever imagined myself getting into. And this is Dykefer. And this is the opportunistic behavior of the sun. If something comes into their path, they will just follow it. We might get there, the leopard might be there, the kill might be there, who knows. Oh. Look at that. Look at that. That is incredible. Armed with brilliant camouflage, the leopard could be 10 meters away in the long grass, and we'd never see it until it was too late. Tomo wants to move the diker carcass onto open ground, so if the leopard does attack, we have a chance of seeing it coming and defending ourselves. And I have to tell you now, yeah, my heart rate's up. My heart rate's up. This is where the leopard is already fed. It's taken out the chest and it's eaten, look at that, straight through those ribs. The power that's gone straight for the heart and all those really, really nutritious organs. And then it's stashed it in the bush to come back later. That's what we've got to keep an eye out on. This is not a situation you want to be in. Mm -hmm. oh, of a leopard approaching. These people rely off their environment. This is a classic indicator of predator versus predator. This is where the claws went in. Look at that. One, two, three, four. That's the claw marks right there where the animal's been held. It's, it's, it's grabbed the animal by the throat with its, with its mouth and its claws have come around the back of the animal right there. Similar in body mass to a goat, this 15 kilogram carcass will provide around 9 kgs of meat. Enough to feed 18 people. It'll yield a much needed 1,000 calories and over 100 grams of protein per portion. Right now, we need to eat enough to fuel our three-hour walk back to the village. Liver. Mm. Okay. Mm. Dry. Very strong. The rest of this kill will be a vital, nourishing meal for the women and children. Life in the village is a day-to-day -day challenge. Illegal poaching and government pressure has eroded traditional ways. By selling handmade jewellery or trading small amounts of livestock, families make just enough money to buy maize and flour. When possible, meals are supplemented by hunting meat and giant rodents are a firm favourite. It's like they've got their tracking radar on. Instead of walking in a line, they spread out and work as a team. Look, it's just beautiful to see that radar becomes from one person to five people out like that, scanning the ground constantly and reading exactly what's happened last night. Interesting to see. There's the 
men are looking for tracks and they, they think they're on the right spot. They always have a man out on the flank and he is checking to see if they're staying on the right spot and they haven't veered off it. we found fresh spore. The pace is picking up. Okay, yeah, look at that. Wow, so the porcupine has actually dug at this spot. This is really, really fresh, and you can see that it's dug down here, and it's eating this root right here. And this is very fresh, so this is the trail that we're on. This is a porcupine here. Okay. So we've come to this clump of vegetation here. And this porcupine burrows all the way around. But the men are looking for the freshest tracks into one of the burrows. We'll only have enough energy in this 45 degree heat to dig one or two burrows out. There is no room for guesswork. We've just come to the other side now. Porcupines have several entrances to the burrow so they can have a quick escape, but the men have blocked some, but this seems to be the one that's going to fit us. Well, him anyway. Porcupines are the largest rodent in Africa. They're nocturnal and weigh up to 30 kilograms. Their underground burrows are like secure bunkers, hard to breach with a secure central sleeping area and multiple escape routes. The only way to find the porcupine is for Toma to go into the burrow. Toma is a shy, quietly spoken man. What he lacks in conversation, he makes up for in bravery. Because he is the chosen tunnel guy. Personally, I can't believe that someone has the guts to go in there, in the dark. If Toma gets too close to the porcupine, chances are it will be super aggressive. It'll thrust its rear end in his face, stab Toma in the eyes with its spines, and potentially blind him. These porcupines are the real deal. I'm just using the night vision on this little camera because I can't physically actually fit down this hole and I can just see his feet at the moment he's gone probably about four meters five meters in Toma is totally in the dark down there if he gets nailed by the porcupine he'll definitely be on the losing side and we are hundreds of kilometers from the nearest medical help Coming back. Nothing. I don't do any here. I'm done. The digital crates in my jacket. I think they got some of them. So he's actually seen the porcupine and now everyone's discussing it. Everyone's got an opinion and input to this. They're making a plan, a strategy. It's all about safety because these are incredibly dangerous and no one wants Norma to get a, uh, a spine in his face. Ngao and Al decide it's too risky for Toma in there. They want to block this burrow and dig in from the other side. All our effort will be put into digging out this burrow. Failure here will mean we won't have the strength to dig anymore. No kill means our only meal will be maize and bread back at the village tonight. That's like working a 12-hour shift and only having two slices of bread the whole day. After two hours of digging, the burrow is wide enough for us to get eyes on the porcupine. Okay, I'm going in. Okay, pass me that small camera. Mm. 
These are incredibly dangerous, and that's why there's so much strategy. He's just moving. I'm going to be very gentle. Turn this around right now. As you can see how close the Pokemon actually is. There he is right there. You can see his eye looking at me. At any point, this porcupine could come flying out of here at me. This is not a position I really want to be in for too much longer. I'm out of here. I step aside to let the professionals in. And Gal widens the burrow so Toma can get a clear shot with his spear. That's the sound of the hollow quills on the back that they use as a warning signal. Back off, back off. The kill isn't straightforward. We thought it was just one porcupine in the burrow, but it's two for one. What Toma actually saw from the other burrow was two porcupines really close together, which means double the danger here. Their spines are layered and act like a shield. To get maximum penetration, Toma must feed the spear between the spines, then push down hard to make the kill. They speared one, now they've speared the other one, and uh, now they're just trying to get them out because the quills are all facing backwards and getting caught on all the roots, so they're just trying to get them out. The nerve endings are still active in the porcupine, and even after death, it warns us of its weapons. comes another one. The desert has provided meat for us. And Gao and his family will eat tonight. He's worked hard to provide for them. He's proud and he's happy. <laughs> Two fully grown African crested porcupines. With a combined carcass weight of over 50 kilograms, they'll provide enough meat for the whole village. Underneath those spines, there's still a big animal. There's lots of meat there. I mean, that is the size of a giant turkey. It really is going to be able to feed a lot of people. This porcupine fat will give us around 1,800 calories for each hand-sized chunk we eat, which our bodies will convert into a huge amount of energy. This is ideally suited to long periods of sustained walking and hunting. So this is the really fatty part the back part of the porcupine. Mm. It tastes good. It tastes like a pork, a pork rib, or something like that, with a bit of a rodent aftertaste. Porcupines are plentiful. 
but endless poaching and the illegal bushmeat trade are robbing other essential food sources from the sand people. It's a long walk home, but I tell you, this meat is obviously just so special. Six hours of digging and hunting, and look what they've got. I survive on about two litres of water a day, whereas the men get by on about a quarter of that. The difference is, my body just isn't used to these conditions, and I'm really feeling this. I'm slowing the guys down. And I really don't want to, because the men need to get the meat back to their families. And Gao has noticed my pace slowing, but he has a solution. We've been walking for about six hours today and I would have just walked straight past this bush but this is the local knowledge that you need to have to survive in a place like this. This tuba is a tiny little plant underneath this fire stick bush and the men are showing me here that this juicy tuba they can use to get water off and survive. There's no surface water at the moment, this is the dry season and getting this out and the men being able to get a drink might be the difference between them getting back and not getting back. We've been walking for six hours now. That and the heat are really starting to take its toll on me. To stop dehydration damaging my body, I need at least two cups of water. Tiny little shoot coming out of the ground. You wouldn't think that that massive thing is under there. Certainly does take knowledge to know that exists <laughs> under the ground from that little shoot. Look at that. So this is a piece of tuba that could save your life. It tastes a little bit like a raw parsnip or root vegetable. It's got a really bitter aftertaste but really juicy Lots of moisture in there. It's actually really good. Really good. It's been one of the longest days of my life, and in all honesty, I'm dead on my feet. This desert village and its magical people make me feel very small on this earth. It feels like 60,000 years of mankind still lives on with the sand people. I get the feeling tomorrow is going to be another eye-opening day for me. Before today's hunt, and Gal wants to show me how his ancestors taught him how to use poison to kill in the Kalahari. And Gal extracts grubs of the Lebestina beetle from their hard casing. These grubs are highly poisonous. It's this poison that the hunters use to give their arrows a deadly dose. The chemical name is diamphotoxin. When the arrow enters the animal, the poison starts to break down the walls of the red blood cells. The effect is similar to being bitten by a cobra or rattlesnake. This is such an effective killer that it doesn't even show up in a forensic autopsy. I've persuaded Ngao to give me a lesson in bow hunting. The sand people have been using these for 60,000 years to kill their food. I get the feeling it isn't as easy as it looks. And there's a pretty intimidating audience. Not like this, not like this, but halfway. Okay. Okay, 
That was my verbal uh, <coughs> bow and arrow school report. Seems I'm doing alright, but I need a few pointers. And uh, your knees seem to get in the way if I was the, the way I was sitting. What a teacher, what a teacher. Gosh, that feels good. That felt very good. From this position where you feel a little, a little sort of stiff and everything and then getting down low really does feel like you're, you're drawing back and your, your whole body is actually going through that aim of that arrow. It's midday. The temperature is already up to 45 degrees in the shade. Today, I might have to walk more than 15 kilometers. The men's walking pace is more like my jogging pace. After Ngao, Touche is the second most experienced hunter. He's been the wingman to Ngao for many years, honing his skills and learning from the master. Three hours after leaving the village, Touche picks up the tracks of one of Africa's toughest antelope. This is Chemsbok. This is a, the antelope with the very, very straight horns. It's so beautifully adapted to these, these very arid and dry conditions. In medieval England, horns from the Chemsbok were sold as unicorn horns. Today, they are still high on the list for big game hunters. They can flee from many predators with speeds of up to 60 kilometers per hour, which is nearly as fast as a racehorse. Ngao tests the wind. We're downwind from the Hemsbok herd. It's blowing towards us. He knows they won't pick up our scent. The hunt is on. Right next to my feet here are the tracks of a Hemsbok. And Kao and I are tracking this together. I'm following him, but there's something very beautiful about walking in the tracks or next to the tracks of the animal. You feel like you've been right there, right in the moment, exactly the same as the animal has been. The wind is in our favor. And we've had rain last night. And it's obliterated all the old tracks. So the ones we're on now are really fresh. Okay. Chaz just told me that this, believe it or not, is the scrapings and digging from the Chemsbok, from an antelope. You'd think it'd be done by something like a, I don't know, a burrowing animal, but it's used a tooth to dig out like that. And if you look down here, there's, a, there's bite marks on this tuber that the animal's taken bites out of. Just there, can you see that? This is one of the fantastic adaptions that these antelopes have, the ability to know where to dig to get something like that. Ngao locates the herd of Hemsbok, about 500 meters ahead of us. While grazing, they're relaxed and unaware of our presence. On Ngao's instructions, we fall back to make a game plan. We will only get one shot with one arrow. If we spook the herd, the hunt is over. The pressure on us to provide for the village is massive. I'm pretty nervous about this hunt. This would be such a great catch for the men. I don't want to mess it up for them.
Is there a fearsome antelope that will take on a lion? They will protect themselves, they'll protect their young, and they have horns that will go straight through you if we get in the wrong place. Just one of these antelope would feed everyone in the village for a week. And Gao and Touche have so much hunting knowledge at their disposal. I definitely feel like a new recruit here. of the nearest adult member of the herd, so we can make a kill shot with the poison arrow. Every time I put my hands and knees on the sand, it feels like touching a stove top. The heat is really challenging me now. And Gao and Touche do this in bare feet and still manage to move silently and effortlessly. African antelopes have brilliant hearing to detect predators. Right now, we're the predators, and we have to be so careful not to blow our cover. Ungao decides this is it. It's time to make our final approach and take our one and only shot. Something is spooking the herd. Agonizingly, they bolt. It is over for us. It could have been another predator that spooked the herd. But if it was, they'll be going hungry just like us. I feel an epic sense of failure. Five hours, crawling on my belly, burning my skin, and the heat sucking the life out of me. I'm tired and frustrated. I know the men wanted to bring home some meat tonight. I really feel for the guys, who all have families to provide for. It just showed me how hard, how phenomenally hard, these people work for beautiful food. It's every day for them. For me, I don't know if I could do it. Ngao and Touche aren't giving up so easily. They want to use the last hour of daylight to hunt. We'll only have until sundown. Being out here after dark is asking for trouble from predators such as hyenas, lions and leopards. We have to roll the dice. This will be our last chance to make a kill. Our challenge in this hunt is that the animal we're after has an armor-plated head, runs fast and can fly. And Gao and Touche will have to hit a moving target and the closest we'll get is 30 meters. This flighty flock of birds are guinea fowl. There are several species in this part of Africa. They can be found in flocks of up to 200. And Gao gets a shot away. But the birds are spooked. Guinea fowl aren't built for sustained flight. Flying is their last option. Instead, they run and use their camouflage to hide. I go jogging and get to the gym every week, but the fitness and stamina of these men is another level. And Ngao is nearly 70. 
Tyson guinea fowl. You gotta stay down low, low, low like this. So you're doing this little leg squat for about 100 meters. And then the men unload about three or four hours each and then sprint. I'm not sure if they've got a bird or if they're just trying to get their arrows. They grab their arrows really quickly and then they go again. It's incredible fitness of these men. One of these plump birds provides more meat than a supermarket chicken. That's if we can kill one. And Gao and Touche work as a sniper team, taking it in turns to be the spotter, one shooting as the other one reloads. All in perfect silence. Unlike army snipers though, our ammunition, the poison arrows, are not expendable. And each one must be retrieved and if possible, mended. <laughs> Got so close to a flock of guinea fowl, but they've got hundreds of eyes watching, hundreds of birds. Really hard. Got to stalk very, very low, and I tried to hang back a little bit to give the guys more of a chance, because my boots going through these rocks make so much noise. And go and touche get their eyes on the birds again. I'm going to hang back and try to keep the noise down. They're within 30 metres. I've got to see this. And Gao is the most experienced, takes the first shot. The arrow misses by millimetres. Touche shoots, misses, and Gao shoots. A hit. interested in finding the really important part of the arrow. I'm trying to bring my heart rate down. A perfect shot, straight through the chest cavity. Sam Kao is showing me a perfect example here of how the arrow works. The arrow has broken off at exactly the right point. It's broken off just there at that link shaft, exactly as it's been designed to. The poison takes effect and the bird dies. Guinea fowl are very, very plentiful around here. It's called a helmeted guinea fowl. You can see by that really wonderful structure on its head there. Good food, yeah? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Good meat. Accuracy, beautiful design, and huge amount of skill and I've seen it firsthand. It's a great privilege. Great privilege. My time with the San has been an incredible learning curve. It's been a dream come true for me. I've learned about tracking and behaviour from the best in the world. I just hope this knowledge is passed on to future generations and not lost forever.